Hello everybody! I hope everybody's having a wonderful day. I want to welcome you to Computer Science 355, Algorithm Design and Analysis. So, my name is Daniel Page. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Computer Science at San Francis Xavier University. So, before I get started, it's worth noting that my office is Annex 9B. Now, it's worth noting because I'm working remotely, so don't come to my office and knock on the door. I am not there. I'll be working remotely, so just keep that in mind. Um, so the best way, press and primary way for you to reach me is by email. So contact me at dpage at sanefx.ca. It's page like a piece of paper. It's very easy to remember. So this is an online class, and I want to talk a little bit about how this course is going to be delivered. Because normally a class like this is one for which I would love to do it in person because this is really a, one of those bread and butter kind of topics I love talking about. So, the first thing I should note is that each week you should expect in this course a weekly update video. So, each week of this class, I'll put up a video, and this will discuss general matters. So for example, announcements about assignments, or if I put out an assignment, maybe to discuss that assignment, it'll be in this video. Likewise, frequently asked questions, in this video. Things of that nature, in this video. <laughs> so I'll try my best to put those types of things in these videos. I want to keep them relatively short and easy to digest. I like to put and have announcements at the start of my classes, but so you can kind of look at this sort of like the equivalent of that for the lectures. So talking about the lectures, you may have noticed that this course is being delivered in an asynchronous manner. So that means that this course is not doing live lectures, instead the lectures are pre-recorded. So when you watch this video, this video may have been pre-recorded sometime before you actually see it. So, that being said, I'm in a mysterious, undisclosed location I'll colloquially refer to as the, the bunker. <laughs> so, so, these lectures are being delivered here at the moment, and they're being pre-recorded, and at the beginning of each week, starting on Monday morning, so on each Monday morning, I'll put up the lecture videos for that week, along with the weekly updated video. Now, you might naturally ask, okay, well, Dan, you can't just like dump a bunch of videos and expect me to watch them. Well, so here's the great thing. Now, I made sure that the department has allocated time slots for 355 so you can sit down and actually have a time to watch these videos such that they don't interfere with the other courses. So, which is a good thing, because I really want to make sure you're able to watch these videos and have them done in an accessible manner. So, just look at the course outline. I have designated some time slots there. That would be normally where the lectures would be taking place if this is being done in person. So keep that in mind. So this is also being done so it's a little bit more flexible because that's what I really want to do. Because in these times I want to try to be a little bit flexible when it comes to content delivery with you. Now you might ask, okay, well everything up here seems to be you talking to us. Well, how do we talk to, how do you talk to Dan? How do you talk to me? Well, for every week, for sufficient reason, we will have optional meeting times. So this will be basically an hour to an hour and a half that I'll ask you a question, I'll give you a question at the beginning of the course with a set of time slots and we'll try to find a time where most of us can work together to try to have a time where we can all come together and chat about things in the class. So what is this about? So this is a way for our class to get together, all together online virtually. So I'll probably be using Microsoft Teams to do this. Uh, and what we'll do is I'll bring some possible examples to go through along with things. So that uh, say, for example, if we really don't have a whole lot to talk about, I'll bring some examples, we'll walk through some. And keep in mind that I'm not going to be doing any new or required materials in these meetings, they're purely optional. So if you don't want to attend them, any materials that I go through in them, so they will primarily just be examples. 
So they'll just be examples or things that I won't require you to read. They will be posted after the meeting. So remember, you don't have to come to these. This is just a nice communal way for me to be able to talk to everybody, maybe get to know everybody a bit better, and on a group level, be able to ask me questions because it's simply going to be very difficult for us all together to be able to do everything on one-on-one -on -one all the time. It's probably better that we maybe come together a little bit, maybe once a week and chat about some things. If, say, if you have any questions about the lecture or you want to discuss some things with me, that's cool. We'll do it in these optional meetings. Then, obviously, there's office hours. Again, optional. These will be done remotely using Microsoft Teams, as obviously I'm not my office. And again, I want to be accessible for everybody. So, what happened there? <laughs> there we go. <laughs> office hours. Okay, so these office hours will be done at the scheduled time from the course outline. I like, the, I'm trying to make sure there's a lot of hours for which I'll be available. So if you need to reach out to me, Normally, the, the kind of procedure we'll use is that on Microsoft Teams, you'll send me a message. And keep in mind, I put some details in how to get Microsoft Teams on your computer. Uh, so you'll send me a message just saying, hey, look, I would like to talk to you. And keep in mind, this has to be during office hours. I'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, and then I'll try to video call you or you try video calling me after I respond. And mainly because I have to say this because just in case I'm in another video call with another student, because always it's not like being in person where you can know where the other person is in the room while they're talking to me. So hopefully that's clear to everybody. So we'll have these office hours. This is more for one-on-one -on -one or two, two students talking to me. It's, it's meant to be more like office hours, right? So this will be basically what a week will look like. Beginning of the week, update video. You watch the lectures on your own pace. But keep in mind, you have to keep up with these videos because there's assignments and other things in this course. So that brings me to the less flexible part of this course, uh, the evaluation. So activities we're going to do in this class. So it's worth noting as well, just because I wanted to mention as an aside, these will line up with the time slots that are there on the course, calendar, uh, course outline. So when you see those time slots, I'm going to be basically imagining these video lectures like if they were going to fit in those slots. Okay. Anyways, so in this course, you'll be doing assignments. So these are going to be written assignments. There is no programming at all on these assignments. They're all written assignments. So in this, you can do your assignments on pencil, paper, or pen and paper. You can type yours up. If you want to use, if you have a tablet, if you want to write your your solution in a digital format, that's cool too. Uh, keep in mind, just make sure you take good pictures or preferably scan your assignments if you're doing it on pencil, paper, or pen and paper. And then you're gonna submit your assignments as a single PDF file to me. And this will all be done on Moodle. The course website is on Moodle, by the way. So these will have not flexible deadlines. There is no late assignments. I have the deadlines set out. And in case, unless anything, I'm pers like something I didn't notice in advance happens, those should be the deadlines for which they will occur in the term. So there's assignments. There's going to be uh, two open book term tests. So normally I like doing closed book tests, but due to the online nature of this course, I'm going to be making them open book tests. So what will happen is I'll give you a scheduled date, the ones that are probably in the course outline, and then I'll release the test within some time window. And I'll ask you to complete the test within that time window and submit it just like you kind of would for an assignment. And I'll give you some feedback. These are going to be designed as if they were exam questions with that expectation, just so you get the flavor of the kinds of questions I can ask you on a final exam. So these are meant to give you some flavor of the kind of things I'll be expecting on an exam. Because I like to make sure my expectations are done very clearly for everybody. But, so if you're doing these tests and you find yourself, okay, well I really don't need to go to my book very often, that's a good sign. That means you're doing very good. 
However, I, there's no way I can really take away the fact that it's open book. Just generally look at it as an opportunity for me to give you feedback. That being said, your notes are not worth as much. So hopefully that helps a bit. Now remember, these are in this is a scheduled test, so you, I'll be expecting you to be able to do it on that date. Just like if it was like a midterm. And then lastly, of course, there's the final exam. So the final exam, as I kick the boards, uh, this is uh, going to be following as per regulations of St. FX. I do not know what this format of the exam will look like quite yet, nor do I know when it is yet. So hopefully this will help. So this is going to be the evaluation for the course. Just if you want to look at the breakdown for these uh, parts of the assign, uh, part of the course, just look at the course outline. So just a few things I want to remark is about uh, textbooks. Now, I do not typically like using textbooks in my courses because I like to keep my classes self-contained. What I'd rather have is if you want to have something that you can additionally read to supplement what you're learning in the classes, that's what I like more. Because I like to make sure that you can see more ways of, uh, of understanding the ways I'm presenting things. So for example, if you don't like like say one idea, or maybe you need another source just to see, hey look, am I getting it right? Um, I'll, I have, uh, I've presented a couple of examples of, of books. So, for example, this is the one I recommend if should you need a textbook. A lot of the material in this course you can find as reference in this book. However, my lectures need not follow this textbook. So, for example, if you're really lost on dynamic programming or greedy algorithms and you want another view on this, you can look in this book. You can find that I find this book is particularly good, the one by Kleinberg and Tardos, uh, Algorithm Design. I like it because it gives you kind of the mindset for which you can help derive the ideas, how you get the actual algorithms, which is kind of nice. Another textbook that I consider standard and par for the course is called Introduction to Algorithms uh, by Cormer Lyserson. I always forget the third one, Revest. I shouldn't forget that. That's a really important computer scientist there. And Stein. Uh, so it's also worth noting why I mentioned this. Revest is one of the authors of the RSA encryption algorithm. Um, he's the R in RSA. Anyway, this source is typically colloquially known as CLORS, C-L-R-S. Uh, so if ever you're looking for an additional text, this is an excellent reference text for algorithms and data structures. A uh, lot of material I'll be pulling out will be coming from both these books. So some parts of this course, you'll see that I'll pull it from this one. Some will be from other sources, but these are really good reference texts, should you want some additional readings. So if you want to learn a little bit more beyond the class, these are good places to look. Or if you really want an additional place to read, Good sources to look at. Hopefully this makes sense. <laughs> okay. Lastly, I need to talk about one important thing. Okay. This is an online course. It makes it very tempting to do the thing that you shouldn't be doing. Not being academically honest. You need to maintain academic integrity just like I would. So, I obviously give you these assignments. These assignments and tests, these are all individual efforts. So these are things I expect you to be able to do individually, not in a group. You can talk to your friends about the assignments or if you want to have a conversation with them. However, if you ever have a conversation, I recommend, this is just a helpful rule. You don't have to do it, but it's really helpful. If you have a conversation with a classmate or say a friend about this, just if you're ever in conversation about the assignments or a test, actually not a test, not a test, I should say an assignment, um, just discard any messages or pictures or if it's written on a board, erase the board, leave nothing behind from the conversation. Just only the ideas that you're discussing so that you can put it in your own words. Because a big part of this is putting things in your own words. Okay. So academic dishonesty is not cool. That's the big takeaway here. So if I catch you plagiarizing, or I see that you're copying another student's work, I will not tolerate that very well. So 
Remember, this is your opportunity to learn this material. You're going to find a lot of the stuff that we're going to see in this course is very helpful for algorithm design, hence the name of this course. Um, so this is an excellent opportunity to really grow as a person and really kind of study some more problems and see how you can adapt them using some of the ideas in this class or some of the formal underpinnings of this course and where you can really take them beyond this class. So that being said, when you cheat or do anything of that nature, now I'm not saying you're going to do it, but it's just saying that uh, just in sake of uh, discussion here, if you did something like that, you're taking that opportunity away from yourself by just simply taking a shortcut, something I don't expect you to do because the expectation is that you complete this individually on your own. Now, I have no problem if you go searching for things and you say, hey, oh, I'm not sure about that definition. I'm going to go check it. That's cool. However, looking up, they're trying to type in the problems and try to find the answers online for them. That's not cool. Try to do them yourself. Okay. So hopefully that's clear to everybody. So that being said, I'm going to talk a little bit about this course and its topics. So the first thing I'm going to do in this class is I'm going to pick up quite literally where you left off in 255 and talk about algorithm analysis. And I'm going to be building on top of that a little bit more formally. So I'll be talking a little bit about models of computation. In particular, I'll be talking about how you analyze an algorithm just as a review. So some of this I'm not sure you may have seen in 255, but just in case I'm going to cover it anyways. And then we're going to do a little bit of review of things like graphs. We'll talk a little bit about graphs. And then we're going to start moving into algorithmic techniques. You're going to find in this class, I'm going to build and formalize on top of your kind of the approach that you may have seen in 255, where we think about problems that need to be solved and thinking about it in terms of mathematical reasoning. So what's going to happen is I'm going to take kind of like some of those things you learned from 255 and adapt them with the mathematical backbone that you got from 277 and bring them together because those are two courses that are required for this class. So for example, instead of me just trying to prove things directly, I might use induction. I might use other techniques that you may have seen in 277. I'm running out of breath. I'm just so excited. <laughs> so that being said, uh, you'll find that I'm going to take a somewhat more rigorous approach in this class because that's what is expected of this area. Uh, so when we're doing kind of really nice and fundamental computer science, that is normally the expectation. But I should hopefully give you some appreciation of this should you not necessarily be interested in deep theory about computing. Uh, this is very much going to be a class where you're going to learn a lot of these backbone pieces and I'm going to try to put it together with algorithm design techniques. Where a class like 255 focused on data structures, this class is going to focus only on algorithms. So the first technique I'm going to be showing in the class is going to involve greedy algorithms. So I'm going to, just to, just to kind of illustrate this, I'll bring this back when we start talking a bit more about it. So imagine I have this lovely shopping cart and I'm going to go grocery shop. Now, in a class, a class like this, you may have seen or heard of a technique called a greedy algorithm. Now, those are going to be the first kinds of algorithms we're going to talk about in this course. Um, so these are algorithms where the idea is that we're going to make locally optimal choices so that in the hopes that we get the true optimum, the global optimum. So the optimum after make all the choices at the end. So for example, imagine I have my card here and imagine I'm going grocery shopping. Maybe I have some lovely things. There we go. Going fishing. Go fishing, guys. Okay. So I can put some things in my shopping cart. Now, each one of these has some size to it, but also some value to it, right? I, was, I shouldn't be chucking these in because they, they probably have some value to them, but I I'm sure they can handle it. So I can put these in there. And now, imagine I gave you the constraint that I can put things into the shopping cart. I can pack them in such that they never can exceed the ceiling of this shopping cart. But I want to be able to get the most bang for my buck while I cram things into this, this uh, shopping cart. So, for example, these are mostly full of air, so they're probably not worth as much. So they're full of air, right? <laughs> so, however, I have a couple more items. I got this cool, cool ray gun. It's, it's a water gun. <laughs> 
It's probably worth more than those guys are. But it's very small, right? It probably could easily fit in there. In contrast, I got this big working motorcycle. Now, this motorcycle is obviously worth a lot more than the gun. However, you'll learn very quickly that if I tried sticking this in with these guys, that ain't going in, right? So a greedy approach might be to try to stick as many items in here in a specific order such that I get the optimal answer. So this is an example of a packing problem. Uh, in particular, we're going to see one called the knapsack problem, and we're going to see a couple variants of it. Where maybe in the optimal solution, what you want to do is maybe put the ray gun in, maybe with a couple of these smaller guys. And even though this is really expensive, there's no way it's going to be fit in the shopping cart, okay? <laughs> you can get it on top, but uh, that's the problem of problem formulation, okay? We'll talk more about that. Anyways, so greedy algorithms, you think of what would take, you want to think of as it would say. I'm going to greedily select the optimum I see at that current time. In contrast, after that we're going to look at uh, divide and conquer algorithms. These are ones for which I take the problem instance, I cleave it into subproblems, I solve those subproblems, then I combine it to get the solution. So these would be a top-down algorithmic design technique where you recursively break the problem apart. So for example, imagine I took a big slab of cheese and I cut it with a big knife. And imagine I want to cut up a whole bunch of slices of the cheese for crackers for a party. Now, I could easily just cut it from the left side all the way to the right side. However, what I could actually do is just cut it in the middle that recursively cut in the middles of each one of those until I eventually get the slices of desired width. So, so that's another way you can think about it. And then I got all my cheese I could give my friends. We'll go in more detail about that. In particular, in that section of this course, I'll talk a lot more about recurrence relations and how we can talk about asymptotics with relation to recurrence relations. Because you may have seen how to solve some recurrence relations, i.e. get uh, closed forms for them. Uh, however, I'm going to show you some tricks and techniques you can use for dealing with a lot of these divide and conquer algorithms. In contrast, I talked about that as a top-down approach. Another angle you can approach things at is so-called dynamic programming. Now this works when you can take a problem's optimal solution and decompose it into portions of other optimal solutions for parts of your problem. And assemble, so what you could do is if you have this idea in place, so-called the principle of optimality, what you could do is you could build up the optimal solution by solving smaller problems by expanding a little bit of memory. So you build up the solutions bottom up as opposed to top down. But I'll show you a variant of dynamic programming where you can do a top down if you like. But we'll talk more about dynamic programming later in the class. Now in contrast, um, another technique I'm going to talk about, and this is an extremely powerful modeling technique. So those ones are all pretty far from course and great stuff. Another one I want to we're going to talk about is so-called uh, network flows. Now, a lot of the problems that you may have seen in your computer science classes up to this point, like the minimum spanning tree problem, the shortest path problem, um, you may have even seen some types of matching problems possibly. Many of these are combinatorial optimization problems. A lot of the kind of considered bar and classic stuff that you may have seen, and those are kind of like the, the kind of standard problems in combinatorial optimization. This is considered like one of the hallmarks. So a lot of the theory involving network flows is usually regarded as like, this is what established combinatorial optimization as an area. So in particular, we'll talk about some neat theorems involving flows and some applications of flows. So I'll give you an example of one. So imagine I have a bunch of friends. They have friend number one, Friend number two, friend number three, friend number four. No. Imagine they have really big heads. I don't know. Maybe they're really smart. Wish I was that smart. <laughs> so imagine each one of them. I have four friends here, and I have a series of gifts that I have. So I have a bunch of gifts.
Say this is gift number one, gift number two, gift number three, gift number four, maybe I have a fifth gift. And imagine my friends have different preferences. Maybe they like, maybe this friend over here, they, they like gift, they like, they probably prefer gift one or gift three. Person two might like gift two and gift four. Person three might only like gift three. And gift, and person four might only like gift number five. So you might naturally, actually, ah, yeah, let's go with that. So imagine I have all my friends here, and I know what these gifts are, and I know their preferences. They're dictated by these arrows. If I wanted to make sure I assign each one of my friends a gift, such that they satisfy their, their, uh, um, their preferences, I can do this with a network flow. For example, this is a problem uh, called a, called a bipartite matching problem. The name comes from a bipartite graph. So you can imagine all these vertices on one side and vertices on that side, and the arrows represent edges. They can be undirected edges. And so for example, I could just simply say, okay, well, I can, I can clearly give person one gift one. I could give person two gift two. I could give person three gift three, and person four gift five. So notice that I've assigned each one of my friends a gift. Now, you might naturalize, okay, well, like, I mean, this is a pretty easy instance, but remember, imagine if I had a whole lot of friends, like maybe I have thousands of friends. I don't know, maybe I'm not that popular. Um, but there could be a lot of gifts, and you might want to have a standard way for which you could assign them based on preferences like this. This could be done with a network flow. So in particular, this would be an example of a problem you could solve with a maximum flow problem. So these are going to be particularly powerful, and this is one application of such a problem. Uh, so you'll get to see some really classic combinatorial optimization in relation to this. Finally, and this is probably my favorite part of the course, is NP completeness. So the final part of this class, we'll be talking about more computational complexity theory. In particular, we'll be talking about this framework for which we talk about intractability. So how difficult the problem is. So there are some problems that complexity theorists and computer scientists generally think are really hard. Some are really easy. A lot of the, some of the problems you've encountered in the past usually are thought pretty easy. Like the, some of the ones you've seen in previous courses, like the shortest path problem, is one of the oldest of these kind of classic combinatorial optimization problems where it has an efficient algorithm. There's some problems that do not have this nice property. We're going to talk about some theory that a lot of computer scientists use to help justify why maybe certain problems are harder than other problems. And I'll give you very powerful ways to go from one problem and talk about another problem in relation to it. So such that if I was able to solve one problem, I can actually solve a different problem, even if they don't even look the same. So it's quite a powerful set of theory. So that being said, that's going to be the last part of this course, and it'll easily be one of the more, I would consider more deeper parts of this class, and you'll find it hopefully very fascinating and kind of mind-opening uh, when we talk about computer science. So that being said, we're going to conclude things here, and we're going to proceed to starting our class. So just watch the next video for the remainder of the lecture. So thank you very much and have yourself a beautiful day.